Good evening, everyone. Time for episode 25 of Kerr's Rage, part one of the Dwarahim Staff Saga by me. And we're starting on page 259, about halfway down the page in the chapter titled The Ancient Scepter. <clears throat> and Dao and Kalor are deciphering the words on the witch's scroll, and Dao is about to read it. This is the language of my ancestors, he said. Although our writing has changed much since last these symbols were used, I first learned to read them when I was a boy. My father was a great wizard, and he urged me to learn their meaning as part of my tutelage, but I have forgotten much of what I once knew. Concentrating on the runes brought back all the old memories of his father's care. His past was a simpler time, and memories, both good and bad, strove to reach the surface. His companions didn't see the tears that he struggled to hold back as he read the passage first in the language of his ancestors, and then the translation. This is what he read. <clears throat> when the cosmos was born, the gods waged war upon each other, and the universal structure was created. All beings were equal then, those who mortals now call gods, Dwaradhim, Vanir, or Aesir. They were formed at the dawn of time. They were the birth of consciousness. During their wars, worlds were born and destroyed. Battles were won and lost, and lines of rulership were drawn. Some of these beings chose mortality, while others created the races of fairy, man, beasts, and more so that their great works could be witnessed and enjoyed. But not all these creators were benevolent, and of these, some chose to rule over their creations, and this caused the second war of the gods. The first divine beings to choose mortality were the Dwaradhim, and they discovered new... <coughs> and they discovered new energies, which they drew from the very fabric of the worlds they had, that they had created, but the other immortals saw this new power as a perversion, and they vowed to throw down those who had once been their equals. But they could not easily defeat the Dwaradhim, for they still possessed much of their immortal power. To avoid defeat, the Dwaradhim threatened to destroy all created life and become immortal once again. Some of them did regain their immortality, and these we now call demons and devils. The Vanir vowed to accept nothing less than complete rulership of the heavens, and they swore to an eternal campaign of conquest. <clears throat> the third war of the gods ruined worlds and didn't end until the second age of man. But with the help of the Aesir, the Dwaradhim forged the ultimate weapon and sealed the Vanir in an extra-dimensional prison from which they could not escape. But the Vanir left behind a terrible curse, and they swore that one day they would return as conquerors. And after that final conflict, all that remained of the Dwaradhim became immortal forever, for they had consumed their mortal forms in creating their weapon. They would never walk among the mortals again, for such was the power of the Vanir's eternal curse upon them. The Dwaradhim's weapon was a staff, woven out of the universal fabric, and it could not be destroyed. It created the final borders between the planes of reality and the final barriers between mortals and immortals. Its creation consumed a thousand immortal souls, and its power was as limitless as the heavens. The staff could be used to promote both good or evil, and so it was hidden. <clears throat> Until the time of the prophecy, when its powers would be needed again. I, Antinius Morlinar, chronicler of history, must also wait, for I am no prophet nor sage, but only a historian, and only mortal. This passage is my translation of an ancient and alien work, and as such it could fall somewhat short of perfection. Who knows what the prophecy portends, or what is to become of man? The prophecy foretold of the coming of... And that is all that Tao could read of the ancient scroll. With his help... Kalor carefully recorded the words in his own notes, feeling sure that their true meaning would become clearer in time. 
All in all, the witch had left behind many works of ancient knowledge, although the scroll was certainly the most foreboding. What this unknown prophecy could possibly mean to them, they could hardly guess, and whether or not it was to be or might have already come to pass was yet unknown. Dartin could not be roused from sleep. I think that his body is using sleep to heal itself of whatever else is still damaged within him, Leander said. I've heard of patients with head wounds waking up days or even weeks after the trauma. We don't have weeks to wait, Dow said. Every minute my wife is being taken farther away. I'm sure it won't be that long, Carmen said. The potion seemed to work on him. Maybe weeks will become hours under its magic. Your own injury is still far from healed as well. We must get going at once. We'll remain here until sunrise. We won't be able to catch the army dragging the wounded behind us on litters. When Dartin wakes up, we'll move out. We've no chance of rescuing Karina if we're not at full strength. He was furious with her decision, desiring only to drive forward and free his wife from the abusive hands of her captors. His head still hurt, though, and there was an ache behind his eyes that never ceased. Sometimes his vision would blur, and he knew that he could still do little on his own. I agree with Carmen, Tarek said, and I am certain that we can still intercept the orcs before they enter their homeland. I know a passage through the mountains that leads to the plateau region that they must cross. It will save us a full day's march. I am sorry, Dow said, but I haven't been apart from my wife for decades. I will do what I can to help Kalor study the rest of the woman's works. Without Karina... His emotions spun like a falling leaf blown by the wind. Despite his emotions, he possessed a powerful mind, and inwardly he could hardly resist the temptations presented by the witch's repertoire. They studied the witch's spellbook, scrolls and notes, slowly piecing together the purpose of her labors and the object that she protected. Dao assisted Kalor with his knowledge of the ancient language, and his boyhood memories of magical study began to awaken, like the words of an almost forgotten song. The action of study eased the, bur the burden of his worry, and he knew that his new friends would help him. Indeed, the seeress had secrets of magic that were little known, and it might be time for him to follow in the footsteps of his father. Tarek and Kerr decided to stand the watch together. Taking turns sleeping, they spoke little, but each of them seemed to understand the other's spirit, and a strange friendship began to form between them. They knew the great responsibility that they had assumed in watching over their friends, and no enemies would make it past them unharmed. They were warriors, and they knew the requirements of their station. Kalor and Dao slept little. They were busy translating scrolls and trying to discover the magical functions of the witch's scepter. They never relented, and between Kalor's spells of reading and Dao's knowledge, they slowly unlocked the secrets of the witch's glen. <coughs> They discovered that my family was the last of a long line of protectors that had guarded the scepter for centuries. Many of her scrolls contained ancient histories beyond their remembrance. The orcs had destroyed so much, but the shaman had known enough to preserve one scroll that contained the object's command words, Arcanus Berbera Locus, which meant secret hiding place and in her Book of Shadows they found the key to the scepter's great mystery. It was the legendary Seeker of the Staff, and it possessed the power to locate the four components of the Dwaradhim Staff, an ancient artifact and powerful weapon. Eons ago, the artifact was separated and scattered to the four corners, where guardians were left to protect it from discovery. Without the scepter, the four pieces of the staff could never be found and rejoined, and its power would remain forever unchallenged. Neither Dao nor Kalor could find out what powers the Dwaradhim staff actually controlled from Mai Fenwi's literature. They suspected, however, that it was far more fearsome than a spear that could slay any enemy that it touched. Surely this scepter was the object of the orc's search, the reason for their sack of Nordtown, and ultimately the goal of their captain. We must tell von Mathers of this, Kalor said. If this thing is real, it could be a terrible threat to the realm. And without further ado, he drew forth his crystal ball 
and told the wizard of all they had learned. Excellent work, Kalor, he said. Return with the scepter at once. You will be richly rewarded. We've still got work to do. We've got to rescue Dao's wife. Now, Kalor, I must implore you to return with the device at once. The threat, threat to safe haven is too great. Split up your company if you must, but please return it immediately. I'm sure that Carmen will do the right thing. I'll contact you again soon. Wait, Kalor! But Kalor had already broken his concentration. A strange feeling of doubt was troubling him. The wizard's tone had unnerved him. What is it, Kalor? Carmen asked. You seem troubled. I'm sure that's nothing. But the wizard's tone was strangely urgent. He seemed to place the value of the scepter above the welfare of our company. But it could have just been excitement at what we have found. Well, we've got some time to think about it. They spoke of their mission around the evening's campfire. The mood was sullen, because my family had begun her journey, and death was all around them. There was so much to consider now, so much at stake. Their choices were many, and each of them had worth, but in the end, they would all have to follow their hearts. If they continued on to rescue Karina and failed, then they would have delivered the scepter into the hands of their enemies. But if they turned back and brought it to the king, then they, then they would have done a great service to the realm, but a terrible wrong to Dao. The wizard's urgency was also reason for concern. Then, of course, there remained the new mystery of the Dwaradim staff and its cryptic prophecy. Had it already come to pass, or was it simply the fictional story created by the mind of an insane chronicler? The only way to find out was to go on. Unfortunately, the path of potential failure followed the same course. But what is worse, to try and fail? or to never have tried at all. They each discussed their feelings long into the night, and their passion was great. They decided to hold their votes until morning. Dartin woke with the dawn, feeling refreshed and none the worse for wear. While they packed, Leander filled him in on all the new and major happenings after the battle. Dao's headache was gone as well, and his vision had cleared. Perhaps some of the witch's healing magic still remained in the glade. With the entire company again ready for travel, they packed their gear in record time and prepared to ride. Dao was very worried, because it seemed to him that they had all secretly arrived at some decision without him. When they were all assembled upon their mounts, Kalor brandished the scepter and called forth its power for the first time. Arcanus, their bearer Locus, and the diamond crystal that hung from its crook burst to life, spinning rapidly spilling rainbow shards of light all about the glade. Kalor reeled back in surprise, but he never relinquished his grip. This was truly a marvel. An instant later, he realized that the scepter was pulling him in a certain direction, much like a dowsing rod, and its pull wouldn't let up until it was pointing unerringly north. When it finally reached its intended direction, the diamond spin slowed and its light faded. It seemed so unexpected. But the scepter was pointing in the exact location of Tarek's mountain pass, and beyond it, the orcs. Perhaps they possess the staff already, Dartin said. Or else, Kalor said, it points to another place along the same path. Then it seems that your course still follows my own, Dao said. But I'm leaving when the time comes. I must try and rescue Karina. I'm grateful to you all for what you have done for me. Wait a minute there, elf pup, Kerr said. You've got it all wrong. We decided to do it all. We're going to rescue your wife now, and then find this staff thingy. Besides, wherever this mighty weapon is laid to rest, I'll wager that there's treasure also, and that's more than enough cause for a dwarf. But it's too dangerous to you all, into the realm, Dow protested weakly. What if the scepter falls into the wrong hands? If it does, Leander observed, things would be no worse than if we were never here. We are already pawns to fate. We have a mission, Carmen said, but our friends always come first. The realm is not here to help us now, nor will they ever be when death tries to take us. We've never done anything halfway. Well said, Tarek agreed, for I will see your quest through and beyond as long as York still possess your wife. Odin has put us here for a reason, Dartin said. 
and we have no choice but to follow the path that he's chosen for us. There's no reason for fear, because our destinies are already written. Courage is what matters most. And where Dartin goes, Leander said, I shall follow, for no finer friends than thee could ever be found. Then let's ride on, Carmen said. We've wasted too much time, and the orcs have moved far ahead. Elger, let's go. With her and Tarek leading, the rest of the company trailed closely behind. All that remained in the glen were ancient memories and the still smoldering embers of a funeral pyre. They rode hard throughout the day and into the night. Well, after midnight, they spotted smoke from the orcs' campfires. Several long plumes rose into the night sky, perhaps another half-day's ride to the north. Tarek guessed that the orcs had been forced to rest, lest they kill their new slaves with a continued forced march. But the orcs' fires were scattered over a huge area, which, suge which suggested that their army was much larger than he had guessed. They may have joined with another army, Carmen. There are so many fires. Or they may have met the Prince of the Dwarves. There's no way to be sure until dawn. We could ride throughout the night, but it will be tough going if we enter into battle without rest. We'll camp here and move out at dawn. If the battle is ongoing, it will be long over before we could get there. By noon of that day, they discovered the truth behind the fires. The long plumes of smoke had not risen from soldiers' cook fires at all. They had streamed from an enormous smoldering battlefield. The scene of carnage before them was unfathomable. Fire had swept across the entire valley floor and continued on unchecked until it reached the northernmost hilltop. Bodies of dwarves, orcs, and beasts of burden were scattered all about the land, and most of them were charred black, with eyes burned out and teeth clenched in death. The fighting had grown fiercer as the dwarves had retreated up that final hill, and the earth was slick in places with blood and gore. Dwarven axemen had felled the trees of that mountainside to shield them from orc and arrows, and many were uprooted by the giants that walked among them. It had been a costly battle for both sides. Countless bodies lay broken and dismembered about them. Here and there, weapons had been abandoned and broken helms discarded. Each of them had a tale to tell. A platoon of dwarves had made their last stand upon the hilltop, there they had formed a defensive circle of strength, and countless orcs lay dead around it. The pile of bodies was so great, in fact, that at least ten orcs had been felled for each of the dwarves who died. The last dwarf to fall had been Sir Loren, son of Lord Min and Prince of the Dwarves. His armor and battle-axe were still covered with blood and gore of his enemies. And in the end, he must not have been able to grip his weapon, so slick had it become. And the, uh... That battle of Corindor is is told again in detail at the beginning of the Ice Moon. So you look forward to getting the entire battle and all of its action at the beginning of Part 4 of the Ice Moon. Okay, and we'll continue. The company slowly picked their way through the battlefield, tethering their horses beneath the hilltop. They proceeded on foot because there was no clear path for them. Kerr led them through the ranks of the dead, and each of them followed silently behind him out of respect. Dow searched frantically for any signs of his wife, and he was relieved when they found none. Tarek was certain that the slaves would have been protected by the orcs unless they thought that their defeat was coming. Kerr saw many of his childhood friends among the fallen, and he wished that he had been among them during their last battle. The more bloated and torn comrades that he saw, the more that his inner rage grew, and Tarek and Dao were both of like heart. Carmen cried for them, and she pictured the horror of the battle in her mind. They must have fought relentlessly for hours against the seemingly endless tide of orcs. But now the enemy's ranks were at least halved, and their chances of rescuing Dao's wife had grown. Kerr approached the crest with quiet reverence, remembering every detail, every fallen warrior, so that he could tell the story of Prince Loren's company, Upon his return to the heart of the volcano. He knew them all, friends, fellows, and family. Reaching the prince's side, he knelt and looked upon him with a trembling in his heart. The orcs had propped his body up against a great stone that thrust up from the mountaintop. 
They had respected his battle prowess so greatly that they had placed his great round shield beside him and clasped his right hand around his axe handle. That way he could face the merciless one in his proper battle attire. Kerr was so moved by the sight that he gently took up the prince's axe. Raising it up toward the sky, he said, The prince named his axe Korinkoth, which means Orc's Terror. I shall wield it in his honor, and I shall rename it Korinkoth, Kurragoth, Orc's Terror, Kerr's Rage. Saying this, he then took up the prince's battle horn, which lay gold in its silent upon the earth beside him, and blew three great notes from it. One for battle, he said, one for honor, and one for revenge. He then placed his weapon in the hands of the prince. His axe had served him well. But the prince's weapon had an edge that never dulled, though it be used to batter stone. His weapon would be enough to face the merciless one. Prince Lauren's weapon would better serve Kirk Cape Porter among the living. Exchanging his shield for Lauren's, he knelt for a time before the prince and swore a silent oath. It seemed to the party that this moment was for Kerr alone, and all of them stood about him with bowed heads. When Kerr rose, he had the look of someone who had asked a question and received a profound answer. Striding by them all without a word, he strode down the hill to his pack horse. Climbing aboard the assorted packs that made up his saddle, he turned to his fellows and said, I name this hill Corn and Door, and one day I will return to care for the dead. But now they must rest in Clangadin's hands. We must carry on. Corin Koth, Kurragoth, is hungry. I know little of Dwarven, thou asked of Tarek. What does his name for the battlefield mean? Orc's death was his only answer. He thought that Kur's name befitted the noble hilltop well. It seems strange, thou said, but I now know that a great ally, what a great ally you all have in this dwarf. And now he is your ally as well. In this war, elf and dwarf must stand together. Searching the field, Kalo discovered two quivers full of arrows by a wrecked wagon, probably more loot that the orcs had stolen from Nordtown. He split them with Dao, and their quivers were once again full. It would be fitting to send these once stolen shafts back to the thieves who'd taken them. Common prayed that the souls of the fallen would find pre peace, and Dato knew that Odin himself would have been impressed by the dwarves' courage. Their march away from the field was reluctant. Their hearts were heavy, but their purpose had been made stronger still. Leander was greatly moved by Kerr's emotion, so unusual in a dwarf, and so he composed a ballad to honor the prince in his company's defiant last stand. He mulled over every verse as they rode, and after several miles... He felt that he had crafted a work befitting a prince of dwarves. When he recited it, he did so with all the pride that his voice could summon, and this is how it went. Upon the hilltop Corindor, there marched scarlet knights twenty score, orcs' foes, trolls' death, dragons' fear, Moradin's mighty hammer for evil hearts to dread, dwarven knights outnumbered, doomed, heroic, valiant shields gleaming, taunting death, for the prince's men were but twenty score, and the orcs were ten times more. One by one they wrestled against orc and giant of war, and one by one they fell over tree trunks and boulders and gore, until the last ten did stand upon the hilltop Corindor. And on that hill they fell ten times more, berserk, remorseless, singing death songs with dwarven axe and hammers of war. But at the last... Ten times more slew twenty score, and the orcs revered their enemy's prince with silver shield and bloodied axe upon the lonely crest of Corindor.
sun rose with solemn quiet on the morn. Grieving fellows, heavy footsteps, soldiers among soldiers atop Corindor, the son of Moldrin blowing battle's horn, and there Kerr did claim a prince's blade, a battle axe twice forged and with magic inlaid, Corin Koth by Prince Lauren named, Orc's terror, troll's death, slayer of ten score more upon the hilltop Corindor. And so it was that the axe Corin Koth became Corin Koth Kerrigoth, Orc's terror, Kerr's rage. Truly you have composed a ballad of honor, Dartin said. Never before have I seen an engagement so well fought against such great odds. Prince Lauren's battle prowess was becoming a legend, Carmen said. Even my father spoke of Lord Min's son's awesome skill with axe and shield. Most of your verses are good, Leander, Tarek said, but I believe that this is the best that you've ever created. If I ever return home, Dao said, I will tell it to the fairy king. I will tell, it, tell him the honor of the mountain dwarves. Their conversations continued in a like manner throughout the day as they pursued the orcs northward. Their comments seemed to lighten Kerr's spirit somewhat, but he remained very grim and brooding. His hands frequently reached out to touch the blood-stained Corin Koth, as if some silent conversation were taking place between them. Tarek again found the trail of the slaves among the tracks of the orcs, and he believed that there were many women among their ranks. He led them forward in great haste, and the gap between them and the orcs began to close. And that's where we'll end episode 25 at the top of page 271. Thank you very much for listening. Sorry for my emotion. And as always, remember to read Kerr's Rage, part one of the Dwaradheem Staff Saga, by me, and all of its following novels, such as The Drums of Doom, part two, and The Last Admiral, part three. Thank you, and have a great night.